we have a uh, Priyajit Palip from the University of Texas, Dallas, and he'll be talking with us about grid-like presentations from factorizations of coster elements. All right. So, so uh, most of the things that uh, form a background for this talk are already uh, introduced by the previous speakers, so that actually helps me. Uh, so let's begin by uh, talking about Coxeter groups that, that we already know by now. Uh, so these are groups um, of, of the form uh, with, with the presentation of this form. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, describe most of the things in this talk using examples because that will be easy to understand and relate. So uh, for, for a Coxeter group, the example S4 would look something like this. We have these three generators, S1, S2, S3. Uh, we have these uh, braid relations, relations like these will be called braid relations. The last one is a commutation. And, and we have uh, these extra relations, which uh, when we square each of these simple reflections, they become the identity. So uh, also these generators are called simple reflections, uh, which is uh, which, we, which is something which, which we'll use later on in this talk. Uh, and, and, and let's now look at another presentation corresponding to the uh, Coxeter group. If we just remove these um, S1 square, S2 square, S3 square equals identity, uh, then we get a corresponding Artin group presentation, uh, which is something like this. Um, so this we will require at the end of the presentation or, or maybe around the end of the presentation. So uh, this is an example. B4 is an example of an Artin, present, Artin group. Uh, this is the uh, braid group on four strands uh, where sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, we know they, they look something like this with the first strand crossing over the second, second crossing over third and third over uh, fourth. And the relations uh, sigma one, sigma three equals sigma three, sigma one looks something like this. And this is the braid relation. So uh, if you're familiar uh, with uh, braid groups, then these are very uh, basic. Okay, now thinking diagrams for our presentations. Uh, this is something which uh, we have seen briefly before and I, I think in the first talk today. So for, for a uh, Coxeter group, uh, for a Coxeter system, we can um, form a diagram, a Coxeter Dinkin diagram, where the uh, vertices will, will, be, uh, will be the simple reflections and the edges will be determined by the relations. If there is a braid relation, uh, then it's, it's, uh, it's a edge. If it's a commutation, then there isn't any edge. So, for example, if we look at this one, S1, S2, S3, uh, with the braid relations for the first two, uh, they, uh, for S1 and S2 and S2 and S3, so we have these edges in between them. The last one is a commutation, so we don't have any edge between S1 and S3. All right, let's look at another example. So this one has uh, braid relations for all the three S, uh, T1, T2, and T3. They, let me just say they don't commute. Uh, from now on, I'll refer to them as uh, T1 doesn't commute with T2, T2 doesn't commute with T3, and therefore we have edges connecting them. All right, so this is a Dinkin diagram that, Coxeter Dinkin diagram that uh, can, can encode a Coxeter uh, presentation. All right, now we know uh, if we uh, attach arrows to these thinking diagrams, they become uh, quivers. So we call, um, uh, written definition here, a quiver is a directed graph where loops and multiple arrows uh, uh, between two vertices are allowed. All right, so uh, let me uh, define now what quiver mutations are. So Fomin and Zelvinsky uh, defined this operation of quiver mutation. So think of a Dinkin diagram, a graph with these arrows um, on these edges, and we, we want to mutate a particular vertex. So, uh, so these are the operations that we can perform. First, we will reverse all these arrows that are incident to V. And second is, is this operation, 
where uh, let's say we are mutating at V over here, uh, then these arrows, of course, they get reversed due to the first one. And uh, the third arrow over here, uh, the weight changes, uh, uh, if it were R, if it was R, then it becomes PQ minus R. So um, let's look at an example that will be easier to understand. Uh, if this is our uh, quiver, then if I mutate at A, uh, because A is uh, the, this uh, edge between this arrow from A to B will change its direction. So this is what it will be, all right? If I mutate at B, which is at the center, uh, so first of all, these two arrows will uh, change directions and, and then uh, there will be a third edge uh, due to the second uh, rule in the operation. So this is what it will look like. Right now, uh, we will call any of these uh, uh, quivers as mutation equivalent to each other. All right, so let's just go back and uh, uh, look at what happened. So uh, we first started with these Coxeter groups and then we uh, said that we can encode them using Dinkin diagrams. And now we attest arrows to Dinkin diagrams and we, we are mutating these Dinkin diagrams, right? So now the question is what will happen uh, uh, to, to the Coxeter groups? Can we um, uh, have a presentation, a, a sort of a link to connect these mutations with the uh, uh, Coxeter groups, all right? Or the braid group, the corresponding braid group that we have. Okay, so for that, Barrow and Mars uh, came up with this construction of a group. Uh, they, they said that, uh, well, if you, if you have a quiver, uh, then construct these generators S1, S2, S2, uh, Sn for, uh, for each of these vertices and then add these relations SI, SI square equals E. You can see where it's going, trying to imitate uh, the Coxeter uh, presentation. And then if you have um, uh, like uh, an edge with, with the weight two, then uh, make it a disjoint, uh, make those two vertices disjoint uh, and, and, and so on. The only the extra thing over here is a cordless cycle. So if we have a cycle, uh, then there is the specific relation that we need to add. Okay, so this is what Barrow and Mars uh, did. And, and they found out that if, if they construct a group in this way, then a quiver mutation in the corresponding quiver diagram uh, would, would uh, make these uh, uh, two groups uh, isomorphic. So you have this group, uh, you have a quiver, you, you, you can uh, construct a uh, group using that quiver, uh, you perform a, a quiver mutation and the corresponding uh, group will be isomorphic to the initial group. So let's look at an example. Uh, I, I think it will make more sense that way. So let's say we started with this uh, quiver. Uh, using Barrow Mars, I constructed this uh, corresponding Coxeter group, um, braid group rather, and, and then um, if I perform the quiver mutation on this one, and, and then I uh, draw the, uh, then I construct the corresponding group uh, over here, then these two become isomorphic. So that's what it, it's saying when it says that these two groups over here are isomorphic. So this is the background story. Uh, now we will begin with, uh, with the work I'm doing. So I'm working with Professor uh, Nathan Williams um, at UTD and uh, so uh, this is this is what we are we are coming up with. So we're going to uh, introduce uh, Coxeter elements and factorization on Coxeter elements and and uh, see a picture which is much more generalized than the one that we just saw uh, using quiver mutation and uh, the Barrow Mars uh, construction of groups. So this is uh, uh, this is the definition of Coxeter element. We we just saw these definitions so. It's, it's still fresh. Uh, for, for our uh, purposes, we will look at uh, Coxeter elements as uh, a product of simple reflections in any, any order uh, and, and no reputations, all right? So this is our first result. Uh, we're saying that given a Coxeter element and given a factorization, a reduced factorization of that Coxeter element, so this is our Coxeter element, and let's say this is the reduced factorization. Uh, then we can form a braid group, such as this one, 
using uh, these uh, these reflections in the Cox ray elements, only those reflections, and, and a relation such as this one. Uh, and uh, so the relations are, uh, I have used this parallel and this cross to denote they do not, uh, they do commute and they do not commute, right? It's easier to see it this way. So if they, uh, if they commute, I write this, that that's quite obvious, right? I mean, uh, of course, that was the original uh, relation in the Coxeter group. And if they do not commute, I, I write this one, the braid relation. And, and there is a third relation, which is uh, if they form a cycle. It's, it's very much uh, parallel to what we saw in um, the barrow marsh construction of group. So if we construct a braid group, now barrow marsh constructed these uh, using uh, the uh, quivers, but we are constructing these using these Coxeter elements. If you do that, then these uh, uh, braid groups uh, uh, that we have here will, will show in a while that they are uh, isomorphic. Okay, now let's define uh, Hurwitz move, which, which already has been defined. So again, uh, let me just show some examples rather. Uh, so if we have this as our Coxeter element, uh, Harvard's move um, would, uh, if I perform Harvard's move at this uh, transposition two, three, I'll push, effectively it's pushing two, three to the uh, other side. Uh, and while doing so, I'm conjugating three, uh, four by two, three, right? It doesn't change uh, the element C that way, right? So uh, this, is, this is how we perform these Harvard's move. Now, uh, the group that we just uh, constructed for using the Coxeter element, it's, uh, we have proved that uh, that group uh, is, uh, is invariant uh, under uh, Hurwitz move. So if we perform these Hurwitz move on these Coxeter elements, uh, the, uh, the, the group remains the same, it's isomorphic. All right, and this is uh, uh, a theorem which uh, our last speaker referred to, uh, we have used this in, in the proof uh, so now let's look at an example. This is a Coxeter element, let's say, C. I perform a Hurwitz move. I push this two, three um, over three, four. It comes over here. Uh, we have these uh, way to construct this group using, um, uh, using this Coxeter factorization. Uh, and, and using this Coxeter factorization, I constructed this group. These two will be isomorphic, okay? Now, let's look at the uh, generalization part. So, all right, before that, there is a partial order imposed by this Coxeter element. I have the definition written here. So basically uh, for the Coxeter element one, two, two, three, uh, two, four, uh, one, two, two, three, three, four, it's the dictionary order. Like one, two is less than two, three, two, three is less than three, four. Or if you if you bring in any other reflection, let's say one three, uh, then then it follows the same order. So, but but we have defined it in in a, in a way over here. So I'm just going to skip it for now. If you have any questions, and then I'll show it. All right. Now uh, for this Coxeter element C uh, written in this in, in this factorization, we are we are going to write this as a different factorization, and we will call this two-part factorization. It's, it's nothing new, we just have this bar in between and everything on the left of this bar will have this, uh, will maintain the order, the Coxeter order that we just discussed and everything on the right will maintain the Coxeter order. So let me uh, show an example first. So if I have, if I start with this uh, one, two, two, three, three, four, and I push this two, three over three, four, I, I, and I have to make it cross over this bar. So on the left, now we have one, two, two, four. And on the right, I have two, three. You can see the, the reflections on the left uh, maintain the order. One, two is less than two, four. And the only thing we have on the right is two, three. So it maintains the order, right? Let's see another example. Now I push uh, 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 one, two over two, four. If I do that, uh, it, two, four becomes one, four after conjugation and, and one, two goes to the other side and it still maintains this uh, Coxeter order. All right, so this is what, what we mean uh, by the two-part factorization 
and this particular factorization mutation that we are performing. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, definition. I didn't show it at the beginning. So the definition is that you start with the with a two part factorization of a coxeter element and and start pushing, uh, pick up any uh, reflection and push it to the other side. In doing so, in doing so, maintain the order, the coxeter order that we just introduced. All right. Now, from this two part factorization, uh, we have defined a way to draw a quiver. And, and the way is this, uh, for things on the left of this bar, uh, we will, we will uh, if, if they do not commute, we will draw an arrow from the larger element to the smaller element, okay? For things on the right, we have the same uh, definition from larger to smaller, but if, if they're on the other side, let's say I, I have RA on the left and LB on the right, then the uh, direction of the arrow will be from the smaller to the larger. And when I say smaller, larger, I, I refer to the uh, Coxeter order that we just discussed. Okay, now with all these uh, ingredients, do uh, you um, have a question? My apology for interrupting, but uh, it seems like time is up. So please try to uh, state your main result and wrap it up in within like 30 seconds to one minute. Okay. So uh, now uh, our final result is that performing these quiver uh, mutation is the same as, uh, as it's a generalized version of what uh, Barrow and Mars did. You can see this example. If we perform this factorization mutation over here, the corresponding uh, quivers are here and the corresponding groups are here. So what Barrow and Mars did, we can um, do that using these Coxeter elements instead. But since we are looking at a particular type of factorization, that this two-part factorization, so we are looking at a specific case of our uh, factorization mutation. So the generalized case is much bigger than the uh, quiver mutation. So that's the end of it. And this is like I have shown the whole uh, factorization mutation for the S4 group. All right, so that's the end of it. Right, let's thank our speaker for his talk. Right, is there any questions for the speaker? Is this is this figure here the sociohedron? Yes, it, it's the sociohedron, and um, uh, I have just tried to show how uh, if you perform the uh, uh, qu uh, the quiver mutations on these uh, uh, quivers. And parallel, if you perform the uh, factorization mutation, they correspond. So I'm just showing an example for the S4 case. It's a neat correspondence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other question? In general, do you have a correspondence like this? So you have the isosahedron for uh, type A. Do you have something for other types? Uh, well, that's uh, what we are uh, trying to do for, for uh, the rest of my thesis. So what I have done here, this is only for simply laced case. Uh, so it, uh, we have proved it for the simply laced case and it's working there. Uh, uh, we, we have seen some examples for uh, like the more general cases and it's working there, but it, we need to prove that. Okay. It seems like we also has the questions. Uh, so uh, you, you, I may have missed if you said something about this earlier, but in that associohedron diagram at the end, is there any, uh, is there anything special about the factorizations which don't correspond to just essentially reorientations of the original diagram, like at the top and bottom? Mm, they don't correspond to, uh, sorry. Or, so, sorry, those, those are the ones where sort of the underlying graph of the mutated quiver is a three cycle rather than a path, rather than the Dinkin diagram you started with. Uh, is there anything unusual about those factorizations that reflects that? Uh, well, in this picture, uh, everything corresponds. The, uh, so if, as you can see, these are Coxeter elements with a two-part factorization in it, right? Mm -hmm. But if we didn't take the two-part factorization and we just perform the Hurwitz move, they uh, will correspond to some picture. But uh, again, we only define these pictures for the two-part factorization. 
So I'm just saying that when we are performing these uh, Hurwitz move on these two-part factorization, they correspond to her um, to uh, quiver mutation. But if we if we just take the Cox tree element in general and perform Hurwitz move, they form maybe I mean a much bigger picture. So if you if you just uh, uh, perform Hurwitz move and draw a picture, maybe it will this small associahedron will be embedded in the bigger picture. Okay. Awesome. So uh, let's thank our speaker again for his talk and his uh, answers to the questions.